So we finished hashes and now we are into the next step which is how to use those hashes for message authentication. And uh, in this part, we will talk about the common methods. First of all, what is message authentication? And then three methods, HMAC, CMAC, uh, and GCM, actually. There are, those are the three. And then we uh, finish with pseudorandom number generation using hash functions and max. So when we send a message, we want to protect it from many different kinds of things. First of all, we don't want to disclose it. And that may be optional in some sense that um, sometimes the message could be public. So all of these are not required. These are things that um, uh, we may want. Traffic analysis, that we don't want anybody, anybody to know that I sent a message because particularly in the defense um, arena, it is important to know whether United States sent a message to Iraq, Pakistan, this and that, and so nobody wants, nobody should know even the count of the messages. Traffic analysis. Ma masquerade um, means somebody else cannot become you. Content modification, so nobody should be able to change the, mod ma change the content. Sequence modification, they should not be able to move the messages around so that, you know, second message becomes first. Timing modification, so that they, they could not pay the message tomorrow instead of today. Replay attacks. Source repudiation, that this is important, is that we want to make sure that the source cannot go back on its word. So if the source sends you some message, they cannot say, well, I didn't send that message. So that's where we get into signature kind of stuff. And then destination repudiation, and destination cannot say that it didn't, um, I mean, it, it was not, basically destination was changed, something like that, all right? So the authentication actually is not very well defined, but one definition of authentication is integrity plus source authentication. So we are sure that it came from that source, and we are sure that the method has not been modified. And you can add any of these fields in that integrity thing. Now, if you want to make sure that the timing is correct, you put the time inside the message and then protect it with this whatever integrity check there is. If you want to protect um, sequence, obviously you will put the sequence number inside, you know, the, uh, inside the protected part, and so on and so forth. So putting the source alone does not help that. So basically we need to have something that only source knows, because if you just put the source address and we protect it, that is a very, very, um, not valid proof because somebody could say anybody can put their source address, right? So, so the message had that source address that is proven, but that doesn't mean that I sent it. All right. <clears throat> so we have to make sure that, in addition to the source being protected, somehow we can prove that the source sent it. And we already talked about one of these methods. When we were talking about the public key and private key, this picture is taken from that slide. Is that we take a message take the A's private key and encrypt it. Then we take the B's public key and encrypt it and then we send the message. And then B can be sure that only A could have done this. The only reason this is not really done in practice is that we cannot really handle full messages with public key. Public key methods are very compute intensive. If you can handle 64 bit, that is big enough. You cannot handle 500, I mean, you know, large messages. So we really don't, don't apply public key. Public key method is used only to encrypt the keys, the, encrypt the secret keys, because those are small numbers. And then we send it to the other side in public, and then we can use the secret key. All right? So the, this method, while theoretically it will work, practically it is not used. Instead, what we do is we get a hash or a checksum something and that can be used with any kind of public key stuff you know or any other kind of thing so so what we do is we would we do a crypto checksum so we do a and checksum is would be called a hash as well so we do a crypto checksum and here k is a secret then we can concatenate it to the message so we send the message now here as shown the message is being sent in clear 
but it's trivial to just encrypt it, you know, if you want to encrypt it. So that's optional. That's nothing to do with the message authentication. And your message sent in the clear, and this thing which came out here is put here. So that's basically concatenated. At the end of the message, you have this called message authentication code, MAP. So the receiver can do the same checksum with using the same key and compare that it gets the same checksum as it was came here. Right? If there is no secret key, then this would be simply message digest like MD5. We talked about that last time. We just use MD5 hash to protect the files. There is no secret. Anybody can calculate MD5 hash. But in this case, we we if we want some kind of secrecy so that we want to ensure that nobody else. The problem with that without the secret is that anybody can modify the message and the checksum. So we don't want anybody else to be able to modify the checksum, and therefore we have to have a secret. So this is a common method. Now we didn't say whether this is public or private or you know what it is, and so there are many variations of this. So the MAC is a cryptographic checksum which uses a key K, and it condenses a variable length message using a secret key <coughs> to a fixed size authenticator. So basically, it is like a hash with a key. It's a many to one function, just like a hash, it's a many to one function, so many, many Macs can, many, many messages can have the same Mac, but finding these messages is very difficult. So like a hash, it is one way function. You can get, you can give it a message, you can calculate the Mac, but given the Mac, you cannot calculate the message. So it is, in, therefore, it is infeasible to find another message with the same Mac, obviously, and max would be uniformly distributed, so they are totally random, and max would depend equally on all bits of the message. That means if any bit is changed, the max would change, you know, significantly, which is obviously the, then only it will be authentication, because if we change few bits here and there, and the max doesn't change, that basically allow people to change the message without them um, getting caught. So just like the hash, um, max have max can be broken by brute force attacks, but if you have an m bit max, you would need two raised to m by two. Anybody remembers why two raised to m by two? Why only half the bits? There are some kind of paradox, birthday paradox. So basically, if you have 365 days in the birthday, you only need the square root of 365 number of people to break to find two people with the same birthday. Similarly, if you have m bit hash, m bit mac, you only need square root of 2 raised to m, which is 2 raised to m by 2 attempts to find a colliding message. Macs with known message and mac pairs, so if you get lots of uh, these pairs, then you can do the key search. And um, so basically, because of 2 raised to m by 2, 128 base, um, bit hash today look vulnerable, means you, you generally will not use it. 160 bit is here right now, but as the time go by, we will probably move to higher size hashes. Now, anybody remembers where 160 comes from? What is 160 bits? Is there some particular, particular program or algorithm that gives you 160 bits? Do you remember any hash and remember how many bits it gives you? SHA-1 gives you 160, right? Yeah. So that's the most common hash, and so, you know, that's what minimum you will use today. So, one of the standards for message authentication code is HMAC. So this is a standard. Actually, it's not really a complete, um, it's, it's more of what we call, um, I am not getting the word, but basically it's a design rather than an algorithm because you can add any hash function along with this design. It's like Feistel structure. Feistel structure can be used with many different mangling functions and so on and so forth, right? Similarly, HMAC is a structure that you can use with any hash function. For example, you can use with MD5 and that will be called HMAC MD5. You can use with AES and that will be called HMAC AES. You can use it with SHA, whatever, and you know, you can call it HMAC that, okay? So it can be used with any hash function. And you use those hash functions without modification. We don't change anything to the hash function, we just put them in, 
in this design, which is coming up. And therefore, you can easily replace the embedded hash functions. So as the hash functions become less and less um, secure, for example, MD2, MD3, MD4, we don't longer use. MD5 is, is probably not going to be used too much in the real secure world. So you can still use HMAC. All you do is just replace MD5 with SHA-1, and then later on with SHA-2, and with SHA-3, and so on and so forth. So you can replace that little module in this design. And it uses handles and keys in a simple way. It has well understood cryptographic analysis for authentication and maximum strength. So, so the good thing is that people have analyzed it, and so this structure is good. So what is the structure? The structure is specified in RFC 2104. So basically, if you go to IETF.org, they have all the RFCs. And um, those of us who work in networking area, we keep it on my computer. I have all these 5,000 RFCs on my computer, so I can look it up right away. Obviously, you can Google anything and you can find it. <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> but the real source, Google finds it, is from IETF. And, um, so all the requests for comments uh, are there. So this is one of the networking RFCs. And so this is the structure. So let me explain slowly how this structure works. You take your message, which is Y through this one. This is your message. And you put something in front of it. And then you hash the whole thing. And then you put something in front of the hash and then you hash it again. So you hash it twice. So if you were doing MD5, you will do MD5 here and MD5 here. Right? You hash, you use that module twice. Now, first of all, the question is what do you do? So, because most of the hashes require you to break the message into blocks. For example, SHA-1 might require you to do 512 bits at a time. Even though it produces 160 bits, but it takes 512 bits, right? So you, that is the D bits. So 512 bits, 512 bits, and so on and so forth. You break the message, and you are going to put give one block at a time into this hash thing. But what you put in front of it is is this thing, which is an exclusive R of two numbers, K plus and iPad. K plus and iPad. What is K plus? K plus is a key that you have selected. This is where the secret comes in. This is your secret key, and you pad it to B bits, because the key may not be 512 bit long. Your key might be 160 bit long. So you make it 512 bits. Pad it to B bits. R has to B bits if K is greater than B. Suppose your, your key is 1024 bit long, then you compress it to 512 bit. And that compression doesn't have to be the same, um, this MD5 hash, that is totally independent. So, so somehow you make the key, whatever it is, to, five, to the size required by your hash, this hash, by expanding or compressing. Then iPad is a fixed constant. iPad is number 36 repeated b by 8 times. b is the number of bits, 512. b by 8 is b by 8. 512 times divided by 8 is 64. 64 times 8 is 512. So 64 bytes of 3636, 3636, 3636, 3636, 36. So that power is, you have to remember this is not a power, it's just a repetition. So 36 is hex. So you write <coughs> you write down 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, and then 0, 1, 1, 0, that is 36. And then you just repeat that bit pattern. So you take that iPad, and you take the key, and you exclusive R. So basically what you're doing is you're not using all the bits of the key. Some bits are here are 0. That is where the key will pass. Where the bits are 1, the bits will be complemented. So you get something different. And then you put it in front of M, which you already did here. You, this is the thing you put in front of the message. You hash the whole thing. You hash the whole thing, and then you get this 160-bit hash. 
I like this is the 160-bit hash if, it, if, the, if this is SHA-1. This will be 160-bit hash of S input and the message. Now you take the same key and exclusive R it with OPAD. And the OPAD is the number 5C repeated 64 times. So 5C is a different bit pattern than 3, 6. It turns out basically, if you write down 3, 6 and 5C, they use some bits, very few bits in common, but they have different set of bits. So you use a different set of bits here, and then you put that here as 0 in front of it, and you hash it again, and you get this thing, which is HMAC. So this is what is called HMAC. So HMAC is not one algorithm, it could be any algorithm. If you use MD5, it is HMAC MD5. If you use SHA-1, it is HMAC SHA-1. If you use write EMD, whatever that is, it is EMD. Whirlpool. These are all different hash functions. And so you can use that with HMAC. This is the HMAC structure. So somebody um, did this analysis in the crypto world and they said that if you use this kind of a structure where there is a key in the front and there is a key here second time, then people cannot muck around with this message authentication code. This is very secure and um, this is the best way and it has not been broken. So people are still using this uh, same HMAC. Only thing which will change with time is the hash function. This is also called a keyed hash because you are using a key. Um, the IV is basically could be a fixed number like all zeros or something like that. And so, so that the receiver, the only thing they need to know is the key. And these numbers are constant. So 36 and 5C, the whole world uses those two numbers. All right, so iPad and OPAD are constants. And K plus is basically the key compressed to B bits. And you understand the difference between B and N. B is 512 for SHA-1, N is 160 for SHA-1, right? B is the message block size, and N is the hash size. And obviously, when they selected these constant, a lot of analysis would have gone behind it. They would have tried out all 256 possible values and maybe all possible combinations of 256 values and then they said well these two you know give the highest uh, level of security whatever so those numbers are still used same way 5c and 36. 